If there's any PC component where you're truly spoiled for choice, it has to be in the world of CPU coolers. With a massive number of brands out there offering up air, liquid, and even custom loop varieties at a huge range of different price points, it can be hard to know which to pick. And whether your build can manage with a compact and budget air cooler like this, or whether you need a more elaborate, all-in-one expensive liquid cooled solution. Well, in this video, we've tested up more than 30 of the latest and most popular CPU coolers, so I can recommend to you guys which coolers to consider which you should avoid and what the differences are between air, liquid and custom loop solutions. Let's do this. The Corsair K65 Plus Wireless is a 75% mechanical gaming keyboard with hot swappable pre-lubed Corsair MLX red switches. You get two wireless connection modes with both Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz and up to 266 hours of battery life for non-stop gaming. Customizable RGB lighting, Corsair IQ support and a programmable rotary dial make this a compact keyboard that has it all. Perky RGB lighting, a sleek grey and silver design, two layers of sound dampening and screw-in stabilizers round off a keyboard with plenty of features. I'm going to kick things off by walking through the different types of coolers and what you should consider before buying, then look at the testing methodology for this video and round things off with my recommendations. I'll link all the coolers mentioned today down below for latest pricing and availability too. Now fundamentally there are three types of coolers. You've got air coolers, a bit like this, an all-in-one liquid cooler that looks like this, and a custom loop. Now these tend to get more expensive as you go through the spectrum. Air coolers tend to be the more simple, less elaborate designs, and typically consist of a heatsink which sits above the processor and a fan to provide some active cooling. More expensive, higher capacity air coolers might have a larger fan, two fans or even three fans, and some high-end air coolers even have more than one heatsink. The way this works is quite simple. You simply have a contact plate which sits on top of the CPU and takes the heat from the processor, which then distributes through these heat pipes and spreads out to the fins on the heatsink. It's a bit like how the heatsink in your laptop might work. You're spreading the heat from the core into a larger surface area for more efficient cooling, with all of these fins helping to keep temperatures nice nice and low. Now these coolers can start as low as about $25, such as this Deepcool AG400, or even be free via the stock coolers you'll see included with some AMD and Intel CPUs. Move through the spectrum slightly, and this is where all-in-one liquid solutions come in. This is what you call a closed loop cooler. Now it comes pre-filled, so there's no major DIY element involved, and has a few main components. The first is of course the radiator. This is where all of the liquid is going to be cooled in your system. We then have fans, now these will be of different sizes and different numbers, more on that in a moment alongside tubes which transfer the liquid to the pump block combo. Now this basically is responsible for pumping the liquid around the radiator but also of course transferring heat away from the CPU and keeping it nice and cool. The major difference here versus an air cooler is that we're essentially moving the problem, moving the heat away from the CPU into a separate area and in this form a radiator. Liquid is more efficient in terms of getting that heat removed and that's one of the big advantages of an all-in-one liquid solution. Now as to which one is better between an air and liquid cooler you'll see that in some of our testing later, and it depends on lots of factors, such as, of course, the number of heat sinks, the number of fans, and the size of the radiator on the air and liquid solution. The final type of cooling system is what you call a custom loop. Now, this is where you buy the individual components, such as the tubing, the coolant, and the blocks, all yourself, and assemble this via a myriad of different ways. Now, that might be through flexible soft tubing, which you cut with a pair of scissors, or it might be with hard tubing that you bend with a heat gun. Either way, this is for a real enthusiast-grade builder, and let's face it, if you're going to do a custom custom loop, you're probably not watching this video. It should be noted that like most things in life, spending more money, such as on a custom loop, which is typically very expensive, doesn't guarantee you better results or better value for money. In fact, the price you'll pay for a custom loop makes it wildly poor value for money compared to a closed loop solution, and that's why it's done by enthusiasts who care more about how the system looks or the audible noise levels than they do the price to performance metrics. So you're probably then thinking, what size air cooler or radiator do I need? And to demonstrate the different sizes on offer, I've picked up a couple of different coolers. Now cooler sizes are often measured in millimeters and the millimeter figure basically defines the length of the radiator. Now on this side of me you can see here we've got Deepcool's LS520. This is a 240 mil radiator. 120 plus 120 equals 240. In the middle I've got a 360 mil radiator with three 120 mil fans. 120 times three that gives you that crucial 360 number. And then on my right hand side, you can see the largest. This is a 420 mil rad with three 140 mil fans. You often hear people talk about push and push pull. Push pull is when you have fans on both sides of the rad to push the air through the rad and pull it out the back. That's something you can do to further optimize cooling. Now, as far as what size all-in-one cooler is the best, really depends on the power output of your CPU. And again, the data will help. What I would say is don't go smaller than a 240 mil. You'll find that 120 and 140 mil designs are wildly inefficient and just don't have 
have the service area to enable really effective cooling. There are some exceptions to this, like in a small form factor build where that's all you can fit. But again, that's a more niche use case scenario. Simply put as well, bigger doesn't always mean better. As much as we'd like to think so, the 420 mil design is gonna be wildly overkill for lots of configs. Great for an i9 or Ryzen 9, not really required for an i5 or Ryzen 5 CPU. Similarly, I should also mention the value for money proposition. If you think that upgrading the cooler is gonna be a fantastic value for money option, that isn't necessarily always the case. Say for example, you bought this $200 Corsair H150i. Yes, it would keep your CPU much cooler than a more entry level deep cool AG400 or heck, even the stock cooler. But more often than not on the performance front, upgrading the CPU is going to give you better returns than upgrading the cooler. That's not to say that cooling isn't important. And when you get into those higher end chips, a good cooler becomes absolutely necessary. A, to prevent thermal throttling, where a chip has to run slower in order to keep a lid on its temperature output. And of course, to prevent your system being very noisy and running very hot. Something which over the lifespan of a chip is just not a good idea. So that gives you a visual representation between the smallest cooler I would personally recommend for most rigs and the largest. But how does this all stack up in data when you actually go ahead and test all of these coolers? Before that though, I should talk you through how I, or more specifically we here at the GeekerWatt channel, tested the coolers. That's really important. And that's why you'll see coolers have different results from one media outlet to the next. The main thing is that we use the same conditions to test all the designs. That's what's gonna give us fair results. We used two applications to stress test Intel's Core i7-14700K. That's the chip we used for all of the testing, running at stock speeds with no overclock. The first test was Cinebench R23, where we ran a full thread test for 15 minutes. We did this numerous times to ensure the validity and accuracy of the results. We also tested Cinebench R23 with eight threads. That's given us a realistic rendering workload while using CPU Z stress test tool, again with eight threads to push as much power and temperature through as we could. The reason we didn't just push the CPU to max on a full stress test is because the 14700K is a very hot running CPU. And what we didn't want to do on our maximum and averages was have a flat line. We want to have some granularity in all the coolers and see where the coolers lie in terms of temperature. As far as how we pick which coolers to test, we based this on a few key criteria. We wanted to include all the most popular designs in the roundup. It only seems sensible. That's why you'll see Vectru's V5, Deepcool's LT720, and Cooler Master's Hyper 212, all designs that are selling like hotcakes and have them for some time. We also tested out newer designs from the likes of Cooler Master, Corsair, Be Choir, while adding into the mix brands that aren't typically known for their coolers, like Asus, Gigabyte, and MSI. On top of that, our testing also includes numerous 360s, 240s, as well as a variety of air coolers. Everything from your small budget single fans to your large double tower designs. It's for this reason as well that we should point out it's not necessarily the cooler with the lowest temperature that is necessarily the best or the one that you should absolutely buy. It depends on price too. So without any further ado, let's dive in to the data. The best cooler in our testing was actually Gigabyte's Water Force X2360 Ice, followed closely by the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2360. Now in lots of ways, both of these results are actually quite surprising. First and foremost, uh, with Gigabyte's cooler being the fact they aren't prime primarily a cooler brand and instead better known for making motherboard and GPUs. And while the fans are marginally louder on this unit compared to others in our testing at the stock settings, it did deliver some fantastic results. It was a similar story, as I say, with the Be Quiet cooler, which again at stock settings, which was the way we tested all the coolers for a most out of box experience, performed well above its weight class. This is particularly impressive based on the fact it isn't even Be Quiet's highest end liquid cooler and the fact it's actually not that expensive. And can be found right now for between 100 and 120 euros. US dollars, as I say, links down below. And this was a pattern that we saw across our testing, whereby it wasn't necessarily the most expensive coolers that provided the best results. Take this, Asus's ROG Strix LC3360. I mean, Asus aren't even a CPU cooler brand. They're not a company you go, hmm, Yes, CPU coolers. This is again, yes, part of their Strix line and not as cheap as Be Quiet's Pure Loop 2, but certainly not Asus's most high-end CPU cooler either. And they provided incredibly strong results, as well as being easy to install, looking quite nice and easy to use. I should also at this stage mention Cooler Master's new Atmos range. Now this is where we start to get a bit more premium in the market. But one thing with the Atmos that was very pleasing was the small differential between the average and max temperature. One thing you also see on these higher-end coolers is more consistency in the temperatures. And the differential between the 
average and max figures on this Atmos 360 were significantly smaller than other worse options in our roundup, such as Height's new Thick Q60. And Height's new Thick Q60 is what I want to talk about next. Now, this is a cooler that we were actually generally fairly impressed with in our testing, but one that just shows you that spending more money doesn't necessarily mean better. Now, unlike all the other coolers, it takes a different approach. Trimming the size right down into a 240 millimeter form factor compensates for this with fans that spin at an incredibly high RPM and by having a radiator that is significantly thicker than all the other rads of all the other coolers out there. Now, this did punch well above its weight for its size and beat out lots of other options at its form factor. However, it just goes to show that as cool as it is with a fancy screen and other features that doesn't necessarily compensate for pure surface area and having a larger cooler overall. One massive advantage of liquid coolers as well is that the large number of fans often helps with airflow in the case more generally. Say your chassis comes with three fans included as standard. Pop a liquid cooler in the top and suddenly you're up to six fans with a further three fans providing active exhaust out your case or if the rad's in the front active intake. That's something you're not going to see with air coolers like this whereby the fans only real purpose is to push air through the heatsink. Yes, that might lead to some natural exhaust out the rear of the chassis, but it isn't going to push the needle too far. Now, like every piece of PC hardware, there are lots of features to consider with a CPU cooler, whether that be a fancy RGB water block, some RGB fans, an OLED display, or even in the case of Height's thick Q60, a, well, what looks like a smartphone or some sort of iPad mini in your PC build. Software plays a massive part, and Corsair's H150 is a great example of that. The new IQ Link version, that is. Now, in our testing, it did not perform badly. However, it was hard hardly the best of the bunch. They make up for this with fans which are either that bit quieter, or in this case have individual temperature sensors on each singular fan, or by having better software integrations than the competition. Corsair IQ Link allows you to much more easily control this cooler than other options out there. And of course syncs with other compatible Corsair gear within your system to give you that better ecosystem feel and a more unified feel when it comes to monitoring key data, and of course getting that RGB all nicely configured. Now I'm afraid to say as we work up the graph it's rather unsurprisingly dominated by air coolers. Vetro's V5 and Equals AG400 both do a more than respectable job and are not, to be honest with you, CPU coolers I'd recommend for an i7-14700K anyway. But what is particularly disappointing is that some of the large air coolers don't necessarily deliver great value for money when you look at the cost compared to their liquid alternatives. Put simply, air coolers have their limitations and you see with large coolers like Deepcool's AK620 and Corsair's pretty impressive A115, they hit a ceiling. So much so you might be better for the same money buying a liquid cooler from the exact same brand. Corsair's H150i LCD I certainly expected to do a little better, especially for such a premium offering. While Deepcool's 240mm units finish surprisingly close to their larger and theoretically better 360mm alternatives. In Corsair's defense, the fans on this unit are very quiet and again those stock IQ settings may have hindered performance slightly. Tune up to turbo and you're of course going to get better results. And on deep cool side, they are cheaper units when compared to others in our roundup, something that might explain their positioning in the graph. I also think that with how good CPU coolers have got, this is just an example of how hot modern chips are right now. Ryzen definitely isn't quite so bad, and it's more an issue constrained to Intel. But it's still bonkers to me that we're seeing plenty of max temperatures head towards that 100 degree mark, and we're not even stressing on all cores and threads either. So what are my takeaways from this? What should you consider? Personally, in the modern CPU landscape, I'd stick with an air cooler until you get to about $300 on the CPU mark. Then you want to start looking at 240 and 360mm all-in-one solutions. Deepcool and Asus's new Rogstrix LC3 provided surprisingly good results. While Cooler Master, Be Quiet, and even Gigabyte held their own at the top, or should I say bottom, the good end of the graph. And it's nice to see a bit of a surprise in there. There were some disappointments towards the top of the spectrum, and there are clearly some coolers you should avoid. And I think it would be a fair appraisal to say that some brands adding coolers to their portfolios, almost for the sake of it, should be avoided if you want to to maximize performance. Like everything in life, the answer isn't as simple as buy this and don't buy this. It depends on the kind of features you want, but certainly try and aim and optimize for the coolers that either sit towards the bottom of the graph or offer those better value for money metrics. Talking of which, latest pricing for everything mentioned today will be linked in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, get subscribed, see more from me. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.